you see is history inside our bodies. I mean, each of us, within every organ, within every cell, and within every gene, within every gene of our bodies, contains over three and a half billion years of the history of life on Earth. And it's visible in every, in, 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 throughout our bodies, at every level of organization that we teach about and learn about uh, as biologists. And that really sort of informed the book. And what, um, what, and informs my teaching and research here at the university and, and at the Field Museum. And my real entree, my real area of interest in, in, in evolutionary biology is understanding this great transition, the transition from a fish seen here on top. And what you see is this is a creature, <coughs> excuse me, known as Eustenopteron. It's about 380 million years old. It's a lobe fin fish. It's a fish that for a long time, and we still continue, is, think is considered to be very closely related to this thing on the bottom, which is an early land living animal. And what you see here is the fish to amphibian transition. A fish from about 380 million years ago, an early amphibian or limbed animal uh, from about 365 million years ago. And this is the sort of the, was the textbook story when I went to graduate school in 1987. Indeed, Len Radinsky, who did this diagram in his great textbook, was one of my predecessors as chairman of the Department of Anatomy here at the University of Chicago. It was a wonderful textbook he produced in the mid-80s. Uh, he passed away awfully young. Uh, but his textbook lives on because it was such a powerful and visual reference. And it's actually this figure that, that excited me so much. And what excited me about this figure was, holy cow, this is a huge transition. Going from a fish to an amphibian, it seems almost impossible. I mean, you have, a tra you have transitions in anatomy, you have transitions in physiology and so forth. These things live in water. These things on the bottom live on land. How did this happen? How could it happen? And so, to me, it struck me as a first-class scientific puzzle to go out and try to figure this thing out. And what we've done for the last 20 years, 21 years, uh, is, uh, is to look for new fossils that bridge this gap between fish and amphibian, and, and also, in my laboratory, uh, study DNA and understand uh, the DNA recipe that builds uh, amphibians and compare it to the DNA recipe that builds fish and to understand the genetic differences that make an amphibian different uh, from a fish. So those are the kinds of things we do. It's a very multidisciplinary approach, which is classically University of Chicago. And we're very well suited here on this campus to exploit that, that interaction among disciplines, paleontology on one end and DNA work on the other. Anyway, so this is where I began. And I really wanted to fill this gap. Here's a fish at 380. Here's an amphibian at 365. Well, let's go in the middle and see what we can see. So I started um, my work to try to discover places in the world where we can discover new fossils that could tell us about this transition. And to do that, it's, it's really simple. To th I mean, in, 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 in the, the overall conceptual framework we use is really simple. It's the actual execution is hard. Um, the, we look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age, right? Not rocket science. This thing's 380 million years old. This thing's 365. We want to split the difference somehow. So we look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age. We look for places in the world that have rocks of the right type. Not every kind of rock preserves fossils. And so we, over the years, have gained some insights into what those, those kinds of rocks should be. And the third thing is really important, and that is it doesn't mean no good if my really great rocks of the right age are buried five miles underground. Those rocks have to be exposed to the surface. So it's no mystery then when you like open a National Geographic, you see Paul Serino or others of my paleontological colleagues uh, in deserts working on bedrock because that's the exposures. What we actually do is walk around and look at rocks and see the bones weathering out. And then when we see them weathering out, we dig in. That's, that's the research program for this. There's another variable I didn't mention, and that's not having any money. And so I started my first academic job uh, was at the University of Pennsylvania in, uh, in Philadelphia. And so here's a map of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I began my first academic job here. And when you begin as a new professor, you begin with a lot of things. You begin with a lot of enthusiasm, drive to, uh, to uh, uh, create a new research program. But I didn't begin with a whole ton of money at the time. I mean, things have changed since I started, but we have these large startup packages for our new professors. But when I started, I didn't get a huge startup package. So I needed a research program that I could do on the cheap, and that's fairly regular, that I could do on weekends, that I could do for my car. And so what we did, a graduate student by the name of Ted Deschler uh, and I, looked at a geological map of Pennsylvania. And voila, what you see is here in, in purple, a Devonian age rocks. These are rocks of more or less the right age. These are rocks that could if conceivably span that gap of 365 to 380 million years ago. They're exposed all the way across the state of Pennsylvania. 
So here, very close, within three, three and a half hours drive of my, uh, of my home, uh, we could look at uh, Devonian Age rocks. So that became our research program. We'd get in my car and we'd drive to central Pennsylvania looking to see what we could see. Well, it turns out Pennsylvania was great in a lot of ways uh, for this work <coughs> because this is a reconstruction of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. To envision Pennsylvania in this period of the Devonian, get Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia out of your mind and think Amazon Delta because that's what it was. Um, what you had were a series of highlands to the, um, to the eastern part of the state. You had an inland sea to the western part of the state, where more or less where Pittsburgh is today, and a series of rivers, um, deltas, that drained from east to west. Now, if you are a paleontologist interested in the transition from life and water to life on land, this is perfect. Because if you're lucky, you can sample ancient oceans, ancient estuaries, even ancient rivers and streams. We can work through a variety of ecosystems. It was perfect for us. So this was, uh, so we had rocks of more or less the right age and rocks of what looked to be the absolute perfect type. The challenge with Pennsylvania was it's not notable for its exposures of rock. Pennsylvania is not a desert. And so what we ended up doing is um, following the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation around <laughs> as they built roads. Um, we were really, really lucky because um, in the mid-80s to the mid-90s, PennDOT was widening many roads in the central part of the state. They were creating new bends and turns, and they were doing all kinds of great work. So they'd send these giant road crews out, and they'd just blast rock left and right. We'd be there with our geological maps, and this is an older road cut, and oftentimes they would blast right through Devonian rock. And so this is a road cut an hour north of State College, Pennsylvania. You could see a human being there for scale. Um, that was actually an older one. This was one done <coughs> excuse me, in the mid-80s they, when they widened the road. This is Route 120 uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and what you can see here is the red beds. The Devonian Age rocks are reddish. So if you've ever driven across Route 80 in Pennsylvania, you looked out on either side of your window, you see red rocks, you're probably looking at Devonian is the idea. Um, and what you see are the strata or the layers, like a layer cake piled one on top of the other. And you can see them all laid out here really beautifully. What's really nice about these layers is if I was to show you them in cross-section, what you would see is the cross-section of an ancient stream. You know, we see the center of a stream with lots of gravels, and you see fine sediments on either side. So it really looked like a cross-section of streams. And so what you have here are cross-sections of streams piled up one on top of the other. And what you're seeing is the life cycle of an ancient delta as streams formed, as they meandered, as they dried up. You know, you're, you can trace these streams. What's really great for a paleontologist is these streams contain fossils. And that's what we learned, Ted and I learned really quickly. We started to pick at these sites, and um, the first thing we started to find, this is back in like 1993, <coughs> the first thing we started to find were like teeth the size of railroad spikes. Um, so some monster fish was clearly uh, in, these, uh, in these rocks. Um, then we started to find the jaws of these things. This is the front end of one of the jaws. The jaws would be as long as your arm. So you had you know, these things with teeth like your thumb and, uh, and jaws as long as your arm. Uh, very big monstrous fish, about 16 feet long. And you know, we're picking these things out of the rocks. You know, trucks are whizzing by. You know, you know, sometimes as a geologist, you, know, you, you, you hit these disconnects between present and past. You know, the present you know, is this trucks whizzing by. You know, and the past is this Amazon delta with giant monstrous fish. Uh, in the streams. It, 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 there's an aesthetic to that that's quite beautiful, actually. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, we found other fish. This is a side wall of a fish with its head, other kind of armored fish in there. And then by about 1995, we started to find really something we we're really looking for, which is bits and pieces of bones of early amphibians. This is kind of what we designed the whole thing for. These were great moments to see these bones for the first time. This here is an arm bone of an early amphibian. And you can see we've depicted the arm bone in, in different you know, orientations. <coughs> um, we found pieces of leg. We found pieces of the ribs, skull, uh, and so forth. And what's beautiful about these arm bones is that they're virtually identical to some of the earliest known arm bones discovered in whole skeletons for people who worked in Greenland in the Canadian, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the Arctic. And they discovered them in the 20s and 30s. So we started to pick up a really neat fauna 
And this is really wonderful too because we're getting plants, we're getting insects. What was unusual about these road cuts in Pennsylvania is we were able to sample a whole world, a biological world. Um, and this working with National Geographic, this is what we um, saw. And you, know, you can recognize this guy, that's the monster fish. I was telling you about with the teeth the size of railroad spikes, 16 feet long. We had other, excuse me, we had other sorts of um, uh, uh, armored fish, uh, lots of different kinds of uh, plants, including some of the first forests with trees, lots of small shrubby plants on land, uh, lots of um, insect-like things on land, uh, scorpion-like things and spider-like things. And as I showed you already, we had arm bones of some of the first amphibian-like uh, creatures as well. So a couple of years working on the sides of the roads in Pennsylvania was producing what a snapshot of what the ancient Devonian world looked like, this early world where fish were beginning to walk on land. But there's a problem. Whatever happened already happened. Ted and I soon realized that since we're finding these things, we're probably about 10 million years too late. We're already finding tetrapods, limbed animals. It's a great world. It's showing us a snapshot of this early world. But it became clear that to answer our question, we had to move back in time. Um, and because, again, the questions I want to answer, wanted to answer, were about this uh, transition. So um, back in time we go. But let me just give, let me step back a bit to show you what uh, the kind of things we're trying to af go after. So, you know, fish on top, amphibian on the bottom. What we were finding in Pennsylvania were these things on the bottom. We were finding arm bones, pieces of leg, pieces of the skull, and so forth. But we really wanted to see transitional stuff. And you can see there's big differences, right? You know, these lobe fin fish that are from 380 million years ago have a conical head with eyes on either side. Okay? The architecture of that head is, is different from these early amphibians that we were knowing from Greenland and so forth. These things have almost a crocodile-like head, flat head with eyes on top. The, um, there's also the pattern of bones, actually, I should say, is very similar between these two animals. It's just the architecture is very different. Um, other big differences include a, a neck. Um, fish, particularly these lobe fin fish from about 380, 380 million years ago, have a head that's connected by a series of bones to the shoulder. So every time a fish wants to move its head, it has to bend its body. Right? It's connected that way. So when a fish wants to orient itself to move its mouth around, it actually, in three-dimensional space, has to swim and change direction. Right? The good news is we don't have to do that. Uh, we have a neck where the head can move independently of the body. And that's a transition we see here at this transition from fish to amphibian, where you lose the connection, the bone, these bony plates that connect the head to the shoulder. You actually have the joint that forms between the vertebrae and the neck. And you now have a head that can move independently of the body. Um, so that's one of the big pieces of the transition. And another big piece of this transition, <coughs> which we, again, weren't getting access to in Pennsylvania, is fish have fins. And the earliest amphibians, like every other creature to live on land, has limbs with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles. So we wanted to understand the origin of necks, the origin of this head shape, the origin of limbs from fins, the whole transition. Um, so this is where it stood in 1995. Um, we had a bunch of lobe fin fish. Again, these are fish very closely related. We knew that to amphibians. Um, from about 380, 390 million years ago, where the earliest amphibians, some of which were about 365, most up to closer to 360, and there was a giant gap in our knowledge. No fossils of this kind known from about 375 uh, million years ago. So back to the drawing board, and this is about 1998. Um, <coughs> Ted and I went back to the drawing board and said, okay, where in the world do we have rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, and exposure? To fill, to fill this question mark. And our lives changed one day in the winter of 1998. One day with an argument and that was settled by one textbook, an undergraduate geology textbook, this one. <laughs> what happened was Ted and I were arguing about something or other and um, I f totally forget the context, but I remember um, uh, going through my, my college textbook, this, is, this book is now in its like ninth edition, okay? So this is mine in its second edition, Evolution of the Earth by Dot and Batten, great textbook. To settle the debate, I was going through the textbook and we ran into a uh, figure which was to change the course of our lives. And I'm going to show you the figure and just spend a minute or two uh, describing it. 
This is figure 14 something or other from Dot and Batten. It says, Upper Devonian sedimentary facies, which in English means Upper Devonian, maybe of the right age, rocks, sedimentary facies, rocks that could be of the right type. And what you see here is a map of North America. Here's down to Mexico, Greenland, and Canadian Arctic. And superimposed on that map is an interpretation of what the ancient Devonian world looked like at this time period, or what the kinds of rocks there are exposed across North America. And <coughs> these authors identified an ancient Devonian ocean in the western part of North America. And they identified three areas that had an um, Amazon Delta-like system. Well, the first one you look at is, you know, that's eastern North America. That's where Ted and I were working, right? That's what I was just showing you. So Ted and I knew that, yeah, that's great stuff for fossils. No problem there. Then they identified a second area, uh, East Greenland. Remember I showed you that amphibian in Len Rudinsky's slide? I've been showing it several times. That's a creature from that Greenland spot, from rocks about 363, 362 uh, million years old. Very famous localities discovered by the Swedes and Danes in the 1920s and 1930s. And then there was a third area. As you can see, I'm just leading to it. Um, it extends 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic. Was mapped by Canadian geologists in the mid 70s as being Devonian in age, being mapped as an ancient delta system. I remember seeing this diagram, looking at Ted and said, Ted, do you know anybody who's looked up in the Canadian Arctic Devonian for fossils? He said, I don't know anybody. We ran to our computer, my computer, which is in the office. We did GeoRef, which is a search of the, you know, the geological database. None of my paleontological colleagues has, had ever published a paper on this site. So it was like, Holy cow, this is amazing. So, um, you know, I read the papers. So that, so, uh, that morning, we ran, to the, uh, ran <laughs> to the library and dug out a paper by Ashton Embry, who in the early 70s was a Canadian oil and gas geologist who mapped the Canadian Arctic beautifully. And this shows you the area from Ashton's map. We're dealing with the North Pole. So there's the North Pole. This is Nunavut territory here. Here's the flag of Nunavut. So zoom in here. Here's Ellesmere Island right there. So zoom in, this is Ellesmere in zoom. And what Ashton did is he mapped out where Devonian age rocks are exposed across the Canadian Arctic. And it's across a vast landscape from central Ellesmere Island down to south Ellesmere Island, across Devon Island, and all the way to the western part of, um, part of the Canadian Arctic. And this is his geological column, and he, this is Devonian. And um, he basically identified this formation, the Fram Formation. What he said was, the Fram Formation is identical to the famous Catskill beds of Pennsylvania, i.e. the ones I just showed you, only they're at 375 million years, uh, not 365. Remember the question mark? This filled that question mark. I mean, we were so excited. This all happened in one morning for us. And so um, things got a little weirder. Um, we uh, went to f um, a Chinese food restaurant for lunch. And I had a fortune cookie uh, that day that said, Soon you will be at the top of the world. <laughs> that was, and that fortune cookie is still in my office here in Culver Hall. It moved with me from Philadelphia to, uh, uh, to Chicago. Anyway, so it became clear we had a rare opportunity that you almost never have if you're a paleontologist about enormous exposures of rock, exactly what you want, um, unexplored by, um, <coughs> by your colleagues, and um, in the right time frame. And again, Ashton identified it as a delta system, essentially with highlands to the eastern part of the Arctic and an inland sea to the western part of the Arctic. Perfect, just like Pennsylvania, only older. Um, well, not, not, not entirely perfect. OK, so it's here. Um, <laughs> right, and so I mean, you know, we're, I was working in my Subaru and I was driving in my like, station wagon here. My Subaru would not get up to um, Ellesmere Island. So we're at 80 north latitude which is um, day, in the summer, it's daylight 24 hours a day. In the winter, it's the exact opposite. You know, somehow we had to get food and supplies up there, make sure everybody's safe. Logistics are an enormous issue, as are permits uh, and getting permission to work up there. Um, to give you a sense of the challenges, the nearest human settlement to our sites is uh, 170 miles away. It's a uh, small village of uh, 140 or so Inuit. And this is a picture of that village in um, in springtime, okay, so, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's far away. 
And so what we do, in fact, what I'm doing now, we're going back this summer in a couple weeks, actually. What we do is work with the Canadian government uh, to figure out how to get there, how to get all our food up there, um, and, and come home safely. <coughs> and what we rely on are these planes. So you can take a jet all the way up to, to Ottawa, and from Ottawa you can take a jet to southern Baffin Island. But then as you, you know, get further and further away from cities, you get to smaller and smaller and smaller aircraft, and the supply chain becomes longer and longer and longer. Um, this is a remarkable plane. Those of you who've flown in the bush have probably been in it. It's called a, a Twin Otter, a de Havilland Twin Otter. It's got a stall speed of 55 miles an hour. It feels most unnatural to take off, pretty much in a headwind, because you're feeling too slow to take off. You know, you're pulling up your seat as, as you're taking off. But this thing is so remarkable, it can land on the tundra. Um, and this is near, our sites are just over the hill here. Um, and it packs all our food and people. But we're so remote, the challenge is the plane won't even land in some of these areas. So we shuttle between plane and helicopter uh, to, get to, our, to get to our sites. What this means is we have a very, very long supply chain to get us to our uh, sites and sustain us, or keep us alive. Um, and since we're beyond a tank of gas for this helicopter, what's happening right now for our field season in two, three weeks is uh, we're laying out fuel caches so the, the, the helicopter could leapfrog to us. Uh, so, it's this, uh, so it's a whole logistical chain. Uh, which uh, is, it takes up a lot of time. Uh, six days in the uh, office doing logistics for every one day in the field. So that's kind of what it's all about for us. Anyway, so because of all this, this is, this is our field crew. This is our expedition. Those helicopters have a weight limit of 500, um, 500 pounds, right? So every pound is precious. Um, so we take, you know, all our food goes in these tubs, all of it, freeze dried, dehydrated. Uh, sealed up because there are polar bears out here, uh, and polar bears can smell things, and, and polar bears can eat people, so we like to seal our food up. Um, and we, <laughs> uh, we don't bring a whole ton of stuff, we don't bring a whole ton of people, it's a very light operation. Now this really affects what we do as scientists, because what it means is, well, fossils are heavy. Fossils are rocks. So like, we can only take a small fraction of what we find home. And so, so much of this expedition feels like a salvage operation. You know, there's only one month when you have decent weather. That's July. Um, you're there for four or five weeks, and you're digging like crazy. You can't take everything home, so you're just trying to make quick evaluations of what comes home. And it's often difficult. Now, all these people come home, okay? So that's, that's, that's the good news. <laughs> it's the fossils that stay. Um, anyway, so we began this whole thing. We had the fortune cookie in 1998, and uh, we began in um, 1999. It took us about a year to get permits and raise money, and we were very lucky to be able to get both. And so we started, well, we figured we'd do, you know, west to east. Why not? Be organized about it. And so we started on Melville Island and Bathurst Island out here in 99. <coughs> this is what camp looks like. Um, so we each have our own personal tents, and then we have a kitchen tent. We tend to pitch uh, at the base of large snow fields. So you, can, you drink the water right out of streams. It's really remarkable. You know, people pay like $15 a bottle for water like this. It's really wonderful <laughs> glacial water. I was thinking of funding the expeditions. I'm bringing a lot of empty bottles up. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so we hang out here. These tents are remarkable. They stay up in like 80, 90 miles an hour winds. Uh, this is not a remarkable tent, <laughs> so I've chased it all over the tundra here. But what you, um, what you see, though, is what we do. So every day, we get out of our tents, have a cup of coffee, and boom, over these rocks walking back and forth over the stratigraphy to try to see where bones are weathering out of the surface. That's what we do. Geological maps in one hand and uh, a lot of patience on the other. And it took a lot of patience because in 1999, we didn't find a thing. It was a complete and total failure. But it was a useful failure for us. We learned not to go to the western part of the Arctic. Um, so the reason is we were in the middle of a deep water, ancient ocean. And um, it turns out we were finding fossil sharks and things, but not lobefin fish, not the kind of air-breathing lung fish that we're interested in. So it was pretty clear to us at the end of the 99 season that if we are going to find what we're looking for, we had to move east, okay? Because moving east, since we're in a delta system, moving east meant moving upstream, right? From the ocean to the delta. And that's exactly what happened in 2000. And, and we moved, here's where we started work in 2000, <coughs> in southern Ellesmere Island here. Camp that year, um, or camps, we actually spread around a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. This is, as we moved east, we started getting into more montane stuff. You can actually climb this. It's not too harrowing. It's very soft rocks. You can go up and down. Um, 
And as we did that, we got into ancient stream environments. And once we got into the ancient stream environments, we started to find lobefin fish, the kind of fish uh, we were after. And since then, we've been working in sites like, oh, let me go back. Since then, we've been working in sites like this. Again, here's camp down here. And this is what you look for when you're a paleontologist. This is what I look for when I'm in an aircraft flying over a spot to try to think of where to work. I have a geological map in one hand, and I look for this kind of exposure. Because it's gentle enough that we can walk over it, but it's also um, exposed enough so that when bones weather out, they will accumulate in little piles. That's what I look for as a paleontologist. It's very simple stuff. So that's what we do, walk back and forth looking for piles of bone. The major discovery um, of this whole expedition was made by our youngest crew member, a college undergraduate who joined us. This is him, that little dot there. That's Jason Downs. This is Jason um, three or four hours before he made the discovery of his career and my career uh, in the spot he was going to make it. By dumb luck, somebody snapped this photograph. Ted, I think, did. So what you see, here's Jason. So what Jason did is he just got up. He had lunch down here. He woke up thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got to look for fossils now. So he gets up and he starts looking for fossils. And it gets kind of boring. You don't find stuff uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but then Jason, in about three or four hours from now, was going to walk over this layer. And I'll never forget that moment as long as I live because um, Jason uh, was late coming home. It was like 7 o'clock. The whole crew had returned. We were making dinner. And Jason, our youngest crew member, uh, hadn't showed up yet, reported in. We, you're due back at a particular time. And if you're not due back, we send a search party. And we were about to do that with, with Jason uh, until we hear footsteps to the tent. We hear zip, zip. He opens the zippers to the tent. And you could just see his eyes are like globes. He was shaking. And, you know, in, and our first instinct was maybe he was chased by a polar bear or something like that. But it became clear what was going on. So when you looked at Jason, every pocket of his parka <laughs> was filled with fossil bones. And he was pulling them out on the table in front of us. Um, and so Jason, with his shaking hands, with, this is Jason <laughs> pulling out his fossil bones. Uh, these are lungfish plates and teeth uh, that he pulled out that night, thousands of them. Um, and it turns out what Jason, so basically what happened is, it's dinner time, we said, ah, it's daylight 24 hours a day, dinner can wait. We grabbed a bunch of candy bars and ran to Jason's site, which is about a mile away from, uh, from, from the field site. And this is Jason's site, right here, this layer, this greenish layer. <clears throat> and the reason why it's green and not red is because it's a carpet of fish bones. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fish bones piled one on top of the other. That's what Jason happened on. And that's what filled his entire park, park and snow pants and so forth. So this is us that night. Our challenge then became to go up and down this hill to find the layer where Jason's um, fish bones were coming from. Because maybe these fragmentary fish bones were coming from whole skeletons of fish. Um, this has been a, this expedition has had its ups and downs. We had this huge up with Jason's discovery, but the next down was to come because we had to leave for the field, leave the year, for the year, it was the end of the field season, the weather was turning on us, without finding where Jason's lair was. Um, and the challenge for that is we're not as dumb as it sounds. I mean, it sounds like it's not rocket science to find a lair, but in this case it really was because you see these cracks here, these little cracks? What we have in the Arctic is the whole upper surface of the, of the rock layer. It looks like rock, but it's not. It's dirt that's been churned up on itself. What you have is in, this, in the winter, the Arctic is really, really cold. And in the summer, it's less really, really cold. And so what you have is you know, really, really cold, less really, really cold, and you get this freeze-thaw, expansion-contraction, even with this you know, temperature difference. And with that expansion-contraction, it breaks up the upper layer of rock. You know, and it turns it up to a point where we hit this layer where it, everything had bone in it, but we couldn't find where this, if there were skeletons. So we went back in 2002, <coughs> and you can see Ted, here's Ted, uh, and the field crew, we exposed a lair. And it turns out when we found Jason's lair, uh, it was those thousands of fish, fish bones were created by one fish skeleton after another piled on top of one another. It was really remarkable. Um, and so we spent 2002 removing these, uh, these uh, skeletons of these fossil fish. And what you do is you could see the layer here, and Ted exposed a little fish, which you, won't, you can't see from where you're sitting, but there's a fish skeleton there. Um, the problem is all the fish we were finding were um, not relevant to the fish-amphibian uh, transition. There were other members. And so 
We decided to give it one more try, and this is what the site looks like. This is what it looked like in uh, 2006, actually, after we went back. Uh, it's, we dug a really big hole. Um, and part of the challenge is every year we, the, we go home, if you were to visit the site right now, you would not see this hole. We fill it in. I mean, it's a big hole to fill in, but that's what we do. Uh, because you just want to leave low impact. We don't leave ev any evidence that we've been there. We run a very, very clean operation. Because it's a very delicate landscape here. It's like another planet. You can even see foot footsteps and footprints from many years before. You know, so you don't want to leave a huge, uh, you want to travel lightly on this, this, this earth here. So that's what we do, so we fill it in um, and then dig it out every year. Um, in 2004, um, we were told by our funders and our own sanity that it was going to be our last expedition. Because we started in 1999, we really weren't finding what we were looking for. We were getting closer every year. And uh, I remember having a conversation with Ted the year before that, uh, actually the months before we went uh, up in 2004, you know, should we go back or not? And I'm glad we did because in the fourth day of the field season, my colleague Steve here in, in, in blue was picking rock from Jason's lair where we were getting skeletons and he found this thing. It won't look like anything to you. Um, and it didn't look like anything to Steve. But as soon as he pulled the rock off of here, he said, hey guys, what's this? Ted and I looked at it and it was the snout of a flat-headed fish. Remember what I told you before? Conical head to flathead? I had a snout of a flat-headed fish staring me right in the face. So I knew it was either going to be an early amphibian or something very, very close from 375 million years ago. Even better, the snout was sticking out of the cliff. So if I had any luck whatsoever, and I was hoping our luck would change, that rest of the skeleton would be going into the rock. And that's exactly what happened. So here's Steve's snout. There's one jaw. Here's another jaw. I know you can't see it. This is Devonian rock. There's an upper jaw. There were teeth here. And what Steve did is over three weeks, this is three weeks after he found it, um, just rough the thing out. And then it comes home. My colleague Farish here found another one about a week after Steve. I found another one lower in the hole. Before we knew it, in 2004, we had four skeletons of flat-headed fish um, ready, to, ready to go. We were very excited because we knew this would be um, quite important. Um, and so now the trick became to get them home. So they come home in plaster. We prepare them out in the Culver Hall, in the, right across from Botany Pond. Um, and they come home. The reason why they come home in plaster is they come home in the bottom of a helicopter. So it's a, a, you know, several hundred miles. So it's a, it's a real ride. Anyway, so these fossils came home in 2004. And you need to understand the social context of what was happening in 2004. In southeastern, south central Pennsylvania, there was a trial going on between uh, people who were proposing to teach intelligent design in schools and those who believed that evolution should be taught in schools. And I remember reading, following the trial, as everybody does, that lawyers for one side were saying there were no transitional fossils in the fossil record, which I knew was false. And then over a series of months, something was revealed to me. Take Steve's specimen. It came home in plaster in, uh, we came home in September 2004. It came home to the preparators. Now these are the people who sit under a microscope with a needle removing rock grain by grain. This is Steve's skull. The preparator removed with this needle a bunch of rock. It took him about a month to get this far. Steve's snout is here. Well, his fossil snout is here. And uh, there's one orbit, eye hole, there's another eye hole. Looks like we're looking at the skull from the top. Four months go by. This is the same thing. Boom, what did we start to see? We started to see a head with two eye holes. It's going to look like a little crocodile-like head. This thing even might have a neck, because here's a shoulder, and there's no connection between the head and the, and the shoulder. So to give you a context, Kitzmiller was going on. This trial was going on. Uh, no transitional fossils in the fossil record. Well, here's a fish from 380 million years ago. Here's an amphibian uh, from 365 million years ago. Here's the new fish from 375. This was Steve's specimen. Remember that snout I showed you, which you know, probably couldn't see? This is what it turned into. It's a creature about four feet long the smallest one. We now have about 11 of them. The smallest one's about four feet long. The biggest one, about um, nine feet long. Scales on its back like a fish and fins with fin webbing like a fish. Has other fish features as well embedded in the shoulder. Flat head with eyes on top, although not as flat as an early uh, amphibian. It has uh, a neck, a true neck, where the head can move independently of the body. And when we open up the fin, what do we find? Remove the webbing, you see bones that correspond to our shoulder, elbow, even portions of our wrists. Humerus, radius ulna, even parts of our proximal and distal carpus, which compose our, our, our wrists. A true mix between fish and amphibian found at just the right time period in evolution. It was very cool. We were very, very happy. Um, and it was six years to get to this point. So 
that's the story. Here's the creature. It um, has fins and scales and primitive jaws, like a primitive lobe fin fish. In fact, lots of other features here. And like an early amphibian, it has a neck, wrists, flat head, expanded ribs. Again, lots of other features, which I'll show you. So as the discoverers of this creature, Ted and I had a rare privilege of, of um, giving it a name. And um, so what we thought, since we were up there, really at the pleasure of the Inuit, that local community, they're the ones who give us our permits. It's the hunters and trappers who do it. Um, and they were supportive of us. In fact, we've taken Inuit youth with us in the past. It was really, um, really helpful to have them on our side. So we had this naming project where we um, uh, engaged the Inuit um, elders, which these are they, for Nunavut, um, to come up with a name uh, for the creature. And uh, we had two requirements. One was a name that sort of reflected the Inuit providence, uh, providence as well as what the creature is. And the other is it's a name we can pronounce. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, the name of the committee uh, did not lend a whole lot of <laughs> not a whole, lend a whole lot of confidence that we'd be able to pronounce the name <laughs> they, they come up with. So anyway, so I talked to this guy, and um, I remember vividly the conversation. It was like, okay, we have a fish, and we're going to name it. He said, oh, we'll help you with the name, no problem. We're good with names. Um, okay, um, well, it's, he said, tell me where you got it. I said, oh, it's, we found it in a rock. He said, what? Fish don't happen in rocks. I mean, no hunter finds fish in rocks. You find fish in streams. So he didn't get the understanding. The idea of a fossil was even alien at that point. So it was really a lot for us to communicate what this was. Ultimately, we were able to do it, but it was very difficult. And he said, well, look, I mean, come up with this name. Why don't you tell me what it is? I said, well, it's a large freshwater fish. He says, oh, why don't you say so? You got yourself a tiktaalik. I said, tiktaalik, what's that? He says, it's a large freshwater fish in Inuktitut. <laughs> so it sort of stuck. He came up with a couple other names, but this was the Tiktaalik was the easiest one for us to uh, pronounce. So that was uh, the naming. Um, and so we had lots of specimens. And so this is one of the specimens <coughs> we prepared here. So the smallest were four feet long. The biggest is nine feet long. This is one of the big ones. And since it's like almost as big as a dinosaur, we prepared it in Paul Serino's lab because, you know, they have the bigger, you know, size. <laughs> in fact, one of Paul's preparators worked on it because, uh, you know, it's borderline dinosaur size. Anyway, so you're looking at one of the big ones. It's the fo it's a head of one of the big ones, seen from underneath like this. The head's about that big of this one, so it's, you know, for fish, it's pretty big. Um, and you can see one jaw and another. This is a really great specimen because we started to be able to see the, 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 the bones of the fin. So we saw an upper arm bone <coughs> right here. And we prepared out the entire fin. You remove the fin webbing. What you have is, if you look at our own appendage, what you have is one bone, two bones, a proximal carpus, proximal wrist joint, and a distal carpus. And that's what we see in amphibians as well. See the same thing here. One bone, two bones, a proximal carpus, and a distal carpus. Indeed, a wrist, I should say. These things have joints. We prepared it out entirely. And what you see here, and this is what's beautiful about this, these specimens is, this, so, since we have so many of them, we can prepare the bones out in the round. And what we did here is we prepared out the shoulder. This is the shoulder socket on the shoulder. This is the uh, humerus, the upper arm bone. So ball and socket joint. There's a little difference there with what we have. They have a little saddle here. This is the elbow of the fish, and these are the wrist joints of the fish. So we're able to look not only at the bones, but the structure of the joints themselves, which tells us a lot about how the, the normal posture uh, of this animal. So we were able to reconstruct it. Um, and this is what it uh, looked like in 2006. Uh, you could see it had a, as I showed you already in the specimen, a flat head with eyes on top. Has a pair of nostrils, um, has a neck, has a massive shoulder. This is the shoulder here, which is sort of part fish, part amphibian in, in the kinds of bones that make it up. It has a humerus, it has an upper arm bone, has two forearm bones just like we have, and has even bones that correspond to our wrist and palm. It has uh, over, big overlapping ribs. In 2006, when we described it initially, uh, it didn't have, we didn't have uh, the rear end in any specimen. We subsequently found it in going back. And we have a pelvis and a, a hind, hind limb bones and so forth. We have everything now in several specimens up into the tail. We have no tails yet for this thing. We know it exists, but we just haven't discovered it yet. So this um, creature was uh, announced in a, a series of papers in the journal Nature in 2006. And the big surprise for us was just how much news it got, a lot. This is the... Uh, um, Thursday, April 6, 2006, I'll never forget opening the door and picking up my New York Times and seeing that's the specimen, that's Steve's specimen right there, the lead story, you know, it was uh, two column right, you know, above the fold, it's, uh, that was big. Um, and it, it, it created a, I should say, a very crazy uh, week in my life. Um, now you can see there's a lot, of, a lot of lessons here, 
Obviously, Tiktaalik uh, got on the front page because of the social context. Some people were saying there are no uh, you know, transitional fossils in the, in the record, and here's this beautiful one that we predicted to be there. That's why we went to the Arctic in the first place. That's why we went to the rocks of this age. But the other reason why I was on the uh, front page of the New York Times is the other lead story, I guess, is snow. I mean, so it's a light news day. <laughs> so <laughs> so. <laughs> hey, we, won't, we won't complain. Anyway, but um, it set off a kind of a crazy week. And what was interesting about the week was we started to hear from educators from around the country. And this is like one example. This is Miss Philbin's third grade class in Manchester, Vermont. They, you can see his face here. They did a reconstruction of, uh, of Tiktaalik. Uh, we heard from other schools doing you know, things with, uh, with evolution and paleontology and so forth. And in fact, in terms of one of the lasting impacts of the Tiktaalik you know, public outreach for us, this is actually the biggest thing we do, which is uh, you know, working with schools and so forth. Uh, and you know, how does a paleontologist look for fossils? What do we do? How do we interpret them? It's a wonderful story to use uh, in many ways. Um, but for me, there's a, there's a, a bigger story. And, and that story really is that Tiktaalik, as well as this whole fish to amphibian transition, is not just some archaic, random branch, irrelevant branch of the evolutionary tree. It's a deep piece of our own history. Because what it reveals is much of our own history, our history when our ancestors were fish. What that neck we see for the first time in the fossil record in Tiktaalik, that ability to move the head independently of the body, is something that you could trace to something that became our own neck. That wrist you see in Tiktaalik for the first time is something that was to become our own wrist. Again and again and again, you can trace these things um, very, very, very finely. Uh, for instance, here's a lobe fin fish, here's Eusinopteron, here's Tiktaalik. You could trace the one bone, two bone, little bone pattern all the way up from primitive fish where they just are beginning to establish it to Tiktaalik where you have functional joints to something that actually becomes our own arm. You can do that with the neck, you can do that with the lungs, you can do that with feature after feature, and it's a beautiful story. The idea being that much of our own anatomy arose in our distant relatives living in a variety of different ecosystems. That this transition from fish to, uh, from, from, from fish to amphibian captures a piece of our own history. And it's not just fish, it's worms, it's jellyfish, it's microbes, it's each of us can uh, contain a deep family tree uh, to the rest of life on the planet. The way to think of it is to compare a human uh, to other organisms. So you, know, you think about Albert Einstein. He's a you know, smart guy. He uh, had a really important equation, or a bunch of equations. This is one of them. Uh, I'm not as smart as Einstein, but I have an equation too. And that is Einstein, like all humans, is a bizarre kind of fish. <laughs> um, and the closer you look, the more you see. And you see it not only in the fossils, but you see it in how we develop. And so let's compare humans, as exemplified by Professor Einstein here, uh, to the fish. Professor Einstein is on the left, uh, your left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, if you compare a human arm with one bone, two bones, and, and so forth, to a tiktaalik fin, we see the antecedents of our the early steps in the origin of our arm in the one bone, two bone pattern. The sizes and shapes of these things are different, but the pattern is beginning to be set up. And in fact, we can trace from this to this the one bone, two bone pattern and how it's evolved from humans. Uh, from Tiktaalik, creatures like Tiktaalik, uh, to humans. But the story is also in, <coughs> in embryos and in DNA. You know, Einstein has a head, so does this fish. Uh, but if you look right after conception, say in a human, two to three weeks after conception, what you see is this is what the head looks like, Einstein and everybody else. You have a primordium of an eye developing on either side, paired eyes. And then you have four swellings which form. Okay, these are the famous gill arches. And these are loaded with cells. And they're separated from each by a slit. Sharks have these as well. The embryos aren't identical. They have primordial eyes developing. They have their primordial mouth. They also have these, these, these pouches that are filled with cells. Um, and you can follow the fates of them. In a shark, say a living shark or a skate or any cartilaginous fish, you could follow these things. The first one becomes portions of the upper and lower jaw. The second one becomes a gill bone that supports the upper and lower jaws, and the others support um, from bones that support the gills. Indeed, other cells in these pouches form the vasculature, muscular system, contribute to the nervous system that controls all this stuff. What happens in humans? Follow these same things. We have the four swellings. The first one becomes portion of our lower jaw, and as well as two bones in our middle ear. The second of these arches, the darker blue one, becomes a portion of a bone that supports our tongue and throat. 
as well as a bone in our middle ear. The other two become portions of our throat and voice box. And other bones and you know, muscles and nerves and glands and so forth develop from these. We teach these in human anatomy. These are the famous kill arches that we do in human and embryology. But from our perspective, when you compare this to this, that is the story written in embryos, and indeed even in fossils, showing how a jawbone in a fossil becomes an ear bone in a human. What all this means is that many of the muscles and nerves and bones that I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and nerves and bones that you're using to hear me with right now, correspond to structure, gill structures in fish and sharks. And I could say that with our arms and fins, I could say that with much of the rest of our body. But why stop, at, um, why stop at fish? If you look at a fly, a fly has a body plan. And it has a, a body plan that, an architecture, has a left and a right, has a front and a back, has a belly and a, a top and a bottom. And on that body plan, organs are all in their right place. If we look at the DNA that controls that, there are particular genes that are active during development to control this body plan, left, right, front, back, what organs are in the right place, and so forth. We could trace those genes from flies to humans. And it turns out, versions of the same genes, descendants of the genes from, uh, that we see in, um, in flies, actually control portions of our body plan, front to back, left to right, and so forth. So the idea being that much of the genetic recipe that builds organisms, creatures, as different as flies and worms and mice and fish. It's actually a piece of our own genetic recipe that builds portions of our own body. We, take, we as biologists take that for granted. Because what biologists do is, what do we do in this university, as much like every other university? We study flies and worms to understand humans. The reason why we could do that is because of our deep evolutionary past. You know, I wrote a book called You're in a Fish, but um, uh, judging by the Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology, uh, over the last 15 years. I should have called it your inner sea urchin, your inner worm, uh, or your inner fly. Because Nobel Prizes have gone to people working on those organisms. In fact, two Nobel Prizes in the last six years have gone to five people working on Cenorhabditis elegans, a little tiny worm that lives in the dirt. Yet that little worm is providing insights into how our own genes are worked, how they turn on and off. In fact, it's providing insights to cures of human diseases. So I like to think that if a cure to many of our, the major ills that we suffer, from Alzheimer's to cancer, is discovered, in some way that work is going to be originally involving uh, uh, flies and, and worms. I cannot imagine a better statement about our deep connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to take questions? Yes? Is it thought that the, the movement from fish to amphibian occurred about simultaneously throughout the Earth? Or yes. Um, and, and, and if so, what, what, what caused them to occur? The, um, the locus, what we believe is, if you look at the fossils and the ecosystems, it looked like it's a northern event, not a, not a global one. That if you look, there are creatures like Tiktaalik. Now, that Tiktaalik was discovered in 2006. Other creatures like it are cropping up elsewhere in the world, but mostly northern, in the Laurasian continents, we call them. So it looks like what you have is in the northern climates, you have, I'll just show you, I'm going to go back to that slide from Pennsylvania. Uh, what you have are some of the first forests and aquatic ecosystems capable of supporting shallow streams. So this whole ecosystem is new. So this is an ecosystem from slightly later than Tiktaalik time, but if I was to show you Tiktaalik time, it wouldn't look much different. It would look a little bit different if I was to show you southern hemisphere, southern continents. Um, what you have is <coughs> the, early, <coughs> excuse me, the earliest ecosystems like this. These ecosystems didn't exist until about 390 million years ago. So what we think, and this is speculation, is that these ecosystems originally appear because it's not until plants invade land that you can actually have small streams with stable soil banks. And that is an interaction between the plants and the geography that creates this ecosystem in, in the first place, a freshwater ecosystem. But more importantly, from Tiktaalik's perspective, there's a reason why we drew this big monster fish here, swirling around to eat this poor limbed animal. Um, and the reason for that was one of the <coughs> impetuses, perhaps, to leave the water uh, was to, this, this is actually to look at the contrast between water and land. Land, at this time period, uh, didn't have any large predators. 
Water is filled with large predators. This is not unusual. We find many of these kinds of creatures. Um, likewise, a land is filled with lots of food sources as well. So what we're thinking is this ecosystem, to answer your question, that this ecosystem with large predatory fish, with this stable banked ecosystem of small um, shallow streams existed to allow that, uh, the, the uh, transition to happen. And we believe that one of the forces, although probably not the only one, uh, is some sort of predatory driven escape from water. Yeah? Uh, some years ago I read a book uh, by Stephen Jay Gould about, uh, I think it's called It's a Wonderful Life. He was talking about a, uh, a shale formation up in Canada that had an entirely different uh, series of evolutionary life forms. And I, I've got to imagine it's before the time. I don't yeah, it was 90, uh, he wrote the book in the early 90s, mid 90s. No, oh, the Burgess Bir Bir Shale, yeah. Burgess Shale is a Cambrian. Cambrian. It, yeah, it's a it's okay. couple hundred million years. The, the question I have is those life forms that were so different from anything that eventually became fish and man and all. Uh, do they exhibit some of the same characteristics or were they? What you see in the Burgess Shale, so what he's talking about is this Cambrian explosion that Steve Gould wrote about in the mid-90s, is you see some of the first bodies in the, in the Cambrian explosion. This is around over 500 million years ago. So we're looking at the origin of bodies themselves. And there are many sites now we know since Steve's book was published, there are other sites that are revealing this as well. And when you see uh, the first bodies, you're seeing the first body plans. Remember I was talking about body architecture, where we have a left and a right, and a front and a back. Not everything has that body architecture. Some things are radially symmetrical. Uh, you know, they have other designs. And what you see appearing in this time period in the Cambrian is the origin of new basic types of architecture. Now since Gould published that book, we've learned a lot. Um, we've actually discovered, not we, um, Chinese colleagues, have discovered sites in China from slightly younger, finding beautiful fossils uh, to show that the things in the Burgess Shale that in Gould's time, really only 15 years ago, looked utterly weird, actually are versions of the living creatures. So it's showing what you see in the Burgess Shale is the origin of uh, body plans um, and, and ways of, of basic architectures of bodies. And so, what, and so that step in evolution is not sort of the water to land transition, that's the origin of two eyes, really fundamental stuff. Two ears, you know, that kind of thing. So it's basic architecture. Yes? It looks like it was fairly warm in the area. I'm sorry? It looked like it was fairly warm in the area you guys explored. Yeah. Did the land shift northward or was it just warmer? Land shifted northward. So where we're working in the Arctic back in uh, the Devonian was close to the equator. And so it's, it's shifted up and rotated. So again, it's one of these disconnects. You know, remember I was telling you we were, you know, we're digging uh, in Pennsylvania, trucks are whizzing by and we're digging out these monster fish. The disconnect in the Arctic is, you know, I'm looking at you know, muskox and caribou and you know, it's a tundra landscape and in it is this world. And the reason is the continents move. Yes? Is the reason to think that the transition would have involved the scale you're talking about, four feet to nine feet, as opposed to again, nice sized creatures? Yeah, I mean, it, um, the earliest amphibians, I should say, these guys are actually on the smaller side. So, um, the, um, uh, again, but they're not mouth sized. They're like this sort of thing. You know, they're like, uh, they're like two, two to three feet long. So, yeah, it's not mouth sized, but it's bigger. That, that theory does come up from time to time. People talk about, you know, developing means of support because of, of scale issues associated with supporting the body uh, under a gravitational load. What it looks like, what most of the creatures we're finding in uh, the Arctic, uh, so just remove this creature from your head for a minute, uh, are about four feet to five feet long. The um, Tiktaalik is actually probably the smallest one uh, of the other kinds of fish we find in that locality. We find about 16 different kinds of fish. Uh, a lot of them run about 10 feet long, maybe 15 feet long, which is a disaster if you're trying to, you know, limit what you take home in terms of size. Um, but it seems to be a very large fauna. So um, one notion is, yeah, that maybe perhaps you're developing a, a particular kind of elbow and wrist uh, to support a, a heavy body, you know, which, um, uh, which uh, is used to f do a, a form of a push-up. Yeah. But you're confident you would have, if they existed, you'd, you'd have been able to spot them in the field and not just dismiss them as dust. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, in the Tiktaalik site, we absolutely would, because the bones are very well preserved. We have small fish there. They're just not, um, they're not, it's lobefin fish. So we have lots of small 
of these armored sorts of fish. So, we, so the fauna itself actually goes from small to large. It's just the average size is fairly large. So, but we are finding small things. So I, yeah, I'm confident we'd see them. Not in every site in the world, no, not necessarily. I mean, there definitely is a bias, uh, a collection bias that you see uh, from time to time. Um, yeah. Yes? Uh, as an ophthalmologist, I'm always interested in the development of the visual system. And you described the uh, fish eyes and the change. Have you developed any uh, genetic uh, causation or reasoning as to how or why you've developed the way you did? Yeah, so the, um, the eye is a great example because um, the sort of the master control genes that control sort of the development of a fly eye are versions of the same things that can control the development of a human or a mouse eye. Eyeless and PAC6, two mutants, are controlled by the uh, mutations of a similar sort of gene. And it looks like the genetic cascade that controls um, photoreceptor development and eye development in invertebrate organisms is very similar to the genetic cascade that builds the, uh, the, uh, the more complex eyes in things like uh, humans and mice and deer and so forth. So it seems to be that the, um, the genetic recipe to build eyes was in place very early. And what you see is that um, in, in more, I shouldn't say, prim yeah, more primitive kinds of eyes, not camera eye like eyes like ours, but in more primitive kinds of eyes, you find a great diversity of uh, histological cell types that make up the photoreceptors, of which our kind is one. So yeah, it does seem that you know, the, the genetic uh, toolkit to build eyes is very, very ancient. You know, and that, that really what's happened is eye diversity that we see during evolution is through the tweaking that common and ancient toolkit. Yes? Um, I, I'm not sure whether I have two questions or one, but uh, one ha has to do with scales. Mr. Powell have scales. Yeah, um, on his back, let me show you. Um, Reptiles are further up the tree. So um, let's go back. Um, so here's Tiktaalik. Oh, two slides right in a row I could show you. Um, these are Tiktaalik scales right there. See these if you were to see it. So there's, there's one you can see right out there. There's a whole field of scales, but there's one that just sort of popped out. They're little square things. Um, and so this is a scaly amphibian? It's a fish or amphibian. We call it a fishapod because, you know, whatever. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, um, it has scales and fins with fin webbing. So with fin webbing, you tend to, you know, we call it a fish. But the reality is when you take that fin webbing out, it's got portions of an arm. And so, right, I mean, if evolution's true, then these distinctions should not be, should be our name, words only. The reality is there's a fine grain. So um, what it has is like an amphibian. It has a flat head with eyes on top. It has limb bones. It has uh, half amphibian, half um, fish shoulder but it has scales and fins. It also has gills. We see gill bones. It also has lungs. So, <laughs> amphibians lose their, at what point do the scales go away? Uh, if you were to look, so if you go to my next slide, so by the time you get to this guy, uh, an amphibian, true amphibian, they lose the back scales, like, like, and, and they retain maybe some scales in the belly, but you sort of lose it at this portion. Reptiles would be, if I was to add another couple creatures, they'd be out here somewhere. So like crocodiles and dinosaurs and all that stuff would be a couple, uh, 150 million years later. Yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. In, in your anatomy class, if the students understand this evolutionary thing, does it make it easier for the, to learn all those dark parts of the body? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the, um, the, the best example of that is, so for every medical student, uh, and I'm sure you remember, the cranial nerves, you know, they open the head. And you see the wiring of the head. And you're, they're all sitting there memorizing the 12 cranial nerves, coming up with every version, every name you could possibly imagine. Um, and they don't make sense originally, because you know, it sort of looks like a tangled mess. And why is one nerve going to you know, a portion of the ear and another going to another portion of the ear? Why, you know? and, and that portion, the cranial nerves and the wiring of the head, the plumbing of the head, which seems in us to be so incredibly complicated, and indeed is incredibly complicated. I mean, there's as much anatomy from here up as there is down. When we say that to our anatomy students, they faint, but because they've, <laughs> they've already spent a few months doing this part. And then we say, well, sorry, you're only halfway through. Um, uh, uh, showing them a state of affairs in a shark simplifies it greatly. Because there, instead of having a tangled mess of the cranial nerves, they're more spread out across. So you can see the brain of a shark and the cranial, cranial nerve exit in a very sort of linear fashion, going almost directly to their path. 
So knowing the state of affairs in a shark actually gives you a simple roadmap, mental roadmap, to think about humans. Yes? Uh, the question about the scale, <coughs> when you think of terrestrial animals on a scale, namely uh, snakes, mm -hmm. I was wondering how snakes fit with the yeah, it's a different kind of scale. So um, scales, so you have, and in, 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 by the way, um, uh, 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 crocodiles have a scute, a bony scale. These scales have a very, if I was to pop, show them to you under a microscope, there would be a distinct um, cellular tissue histological signature to them that is very fishy. The way the bones lay down has a very fish-like aspect to it. Very few cells, very sort of layered, as opposed to a snake, a lizard, a crocodile, which have a much more bony aspect to their scales, which was a reinvention of the things later on. Yes? Yeah, I want to give you a chance to comment on a different aspect of your story, but you made a reference to the context of the cultural wars that were going on as you were doing this, and uh, you know, intelligent design versus evolution. And obviously, it's only a few years, and aside from Stephen Colbert making jokes about it, about the other implications to you, and uh, ways in which you could say, a whole bunch of people have written you and said, okay, I'm coming over to your side, or? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny. So, I mean, so after that New York Times front page, you can imagine my email box was pretty full. And um, we, uh, it took me a few weeks to get through. I answered pretty much everything, you know, except the truly wacko, I and mean, there were a few, like, disturbed ones. But, um, but, you know, most of them were high fives, where people saying, wow, that's great, that's amazing. Um, and in fact, the piece of the story that I really get out, like today, what my emphasis was, was discovery. Science is about discovery. Science is not a, an encyclopedia that just sits there in a, in a, on a shelf forever and ever and ever, and we blow the dust off and, and memorize the facts. Science is about going, taking risks and finding new things. And with paleontology, it's about discovery too. So the piece I like to say is it's a predictive science, that we go out, make predictions, and we can test those predictions. Like so, we went out and said, here's 380, here's 365 or so, boom, tiktolic. That was the idea. Um, that was kind of the, the, the piece that I've, I've been talking about mostly. But in terms of the, the patch that's hit me, no, you'd think with a book that's come out that you're in a fish. I mean, you'd think with tiktolic that I would be, you know, uh, have a target on my back. Yeah. But no, not at all. Nothing like that, really. I'm, I can't say that I've had much other than a few emails from people or... Occasionally, somebody, if I do a call in radio show, somebody will call. Um, but no, not, no, it's not been too, too bad. Yeah? Would you say, you had mentioned that, you know, TikTok also has lungs. Would you say that evolves concurrently with, you know, the great load-bearing limbs? Lungs are primitive. So, in fact, if you go down the evolution of tree, these things had lungs already. And their ancestors, so lungs are actually really ancient. And that's what most people don't realize. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. The lungs actually are very primitive structures in fish. And they arose in fish not to live on land, but to exist in water that has low oxygen content. And so, they, so fish often, many times, have evolved the ability to breathe air. And in one lineage, our lineage, they evolved lungs to do that. But other fish to breathe air have vascularized their mouth, uh, portions of their swim bladders and so forth. So they'll gulp air um, and, 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 and do oxygen change through their digestive tract. Um, so fish have evolved many ways to breathe air. Um, and lungs is actually one primitive version. So the idea is lungs have always been around. They were around. And then these things, just like Tiktaalik, had both gills and lungs, which sort of pre-adapted them in a way to, to life on land. Yeah. Yes? Do you have any theories to the evolution of the flathead? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it helps to think where we're finding Tiktaalik. And um, <coughs> Tiktaalik is really very much a living in the shallows. It's, a, it's an animal that's living in, not in a giant stream, but in a shallow stream. So think to, when you're thinking, if you think crocodile-like animal with a flat head, it's either living at that interface between water and land with its nostrils in front, looking for animals to eat on, you know, in the air, like the, the bugs that are around it. Or in the shallows, it could exist on the bottom of the water column looking at the fish that are swimming above it, because Tiktaalik is a carnivore. So either living on the bottom or on the top in the interface, it's actually, a, a, and you see that again and again in different kinds of fish. Yes? Yeah, so we could see, so in my lab, we work on the genes uh, in fish. And what you can see is amazing mutations. So when you look at genes that control uh, major portions of the recipe of the body, the so-called regulatory genes that control the activity of other genes, a small change in those genes can produce unbelievable changes. Like so, one of the big, big breakthroughs that led to an understanding of flies uh, and, and all our bodies was 
people discovered mutants of flies that had, these flies have an antenna up here, that had a, a, a leg where the antenna should be. It was a mutant. But they isolated the DNA from that, and that was the window to understanding the genes that build bodies. So you can have mutations in these toolkit genes, the architecture genes, that can change lots of the portions of the body. And we can induce them in the laboratory all the time. And so we can manipulate these genes. We can turn them off. We can turn them on in weird places. Um, we can swap them between species. Uh, and we can show the extent to which you can have, don't worry, we don't do this in humans. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, <laughs> we do it in flies and worms and things. Um, uh, we could show the extent to which uh, small changes in these genes can bring about you know, big changes in bodies. Yes? Uh, speaking of that evolution is true, which you mentioned before, did you see the recent article in the article New York Times about that in Texas the Board of Education is considering uh, having high school textbooks uh, uh, by the weaknesses of the uh, evolutionary yeah, I saw that. Uh, uh, in, in teaching uh, biology as if uh, the, for the duration of the Campion period particularly, as if since it can't explain it, there has to be some other reason, maybe it's invalid, sort of treating the theory as a hunch. Yeah, it's, I mean, so that's a particularly bad example for them, the Cameron explosion, because in the last 10 years, uh, we've discovered an older site than the Cameron explosion that shows the origin of many of those body plans. And that's the beauty of science. Come back in 15 years, you're going to find a whole different story than what I told you. Science is a process, a way of knowing. And you, you know, what I've showed you is a snapshot of a very dynamic enterprise. And so we need the strength and weaknesses things. It's obviously, I believe it's a sham, right, obviously. Um, and when you deal with the weak, I could think of many weaknesses of evolution, uh, as with any good idea. But they're not with the fact of evolution. They're not with that evolution occurred, or that we've evolved from fish. They're more with individual details, individual theories we might have about how that happened. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's, it, it feels like the, the strengths and weaknesses uh, thing, you could do that with any human enterprise, but that's not an argument against, against science. Um, and the, um, that's why I think what we have to do as scientists is get the word out to some extent. Science is not about the known, it's about the unknown. You know, I, and you know, I dwell in the unknown. That's what it's about. If we knew everything, I'd be out of business, and I wouldn't go into science. They have the fun is discovering stuff. And it's sort of that aspect of thing, the, the unknown, which which the enemies of science see as a weakness, and I see as the raison d'etre for science, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the real issue here. Yes? So you also found some Oh, yeah, well, they're all over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you do see them. Um, what we're mostly looking at are genes like the Hox genes, hedgehog genes, bone morphogenetic proteins, BMPs, the bone uh, fibroblast, uh, FGF, fibroblast growth, growth factors, things like that. Um, Well, great. Well, thank you very much.